How y'all doing today? Awesome. Thank you for coming out. It's good to be back with you. And I missed you last week. Um, but I am uh, thankful. Uh, Pastor Jafar stepped in at the last minute. I called him in and he stepped in and he brought it. I'm so thankful for him. He'll be back with us on Labor Day weekend. It's always called High Attendance Sunday here. Uh, so he'll be back preaching then. And then we'll have David Mayo preaching the following week for the first time. Preach. Is that all right? It's preaching time. Go ahead and grab your Bible. Let's we'll be to Nehemiah chapter 13. Uh, Nehemiah chapter 13. We'll be covering the whole chapter today. If you don't have a copy of God's Word, just raise your hand. Uh, there will see them there for $19.99. You can have one actually. You know, just raise your hand and you can get one uh, already bookmarked to Nehemiah chapter 13. If you're watching online, welcome. Uh, our online deacon, Ben Wright, will have a link for you to click and follow along. We just believe really strongly that you should have the Word of God open as it is preached. Um, and if you have any questions or whatever, man, feel free to message me and we'll be happy to pray with you and answer any questions. Right now, if you're able, please stand in honor of reading God's Word. Nehemiah chapter 13. This is the last week of difficult days for a while, right? At that time, the book of Moses was read publicly to the people. The command was found written in it, no Ammonite or Moabite should ever enter the assembly of God because they did not meet the Israelites with food and water. Instead, they hired Baal against them to curse them, but our God turned the curse into a blessing. When they heard the law, they separated all of the mixed descent from Israel. Now, before the priest Eliashib had been put in charge of the storerooms of the house of our God, he was a relative of Tobiah and had prepared a large room for him where they had previously stored for the grain offerings, the frankincense, the articles of the tenth of the grains, new wine, fresh oil prescribed for the Levites, singers, gatekeepers, along with the contributions for the priest. While all this was happening, I was not in Jerusalem. That's key there, all right? Because I had returned to King Artaxerxes of Babylon in the third, 32nd year of his reign. It was only later that I asked the king for a leave of absence so I could return to Jerusalem. Then I discovered the evil that Eliashib had done on behalf of the Bible by providing him a room in the courts of God's house. I was greatly displeased and threw all of Tobiah's household possessions out of the room, ordered that the rooms be purified, and I had the articles of the house of God restored there along with the grain offering and frankincense. I also found out that because the portions for the Levites had not been given, each of the Levites and singers performing the service had gone back to his own field. Therefore, I rebuked the officials, asking, Why has the house of God been neglected? I gathered the Levites and singers together and stationed them at their post. Then all Judah brought a tenth of the grain, new wine, and fresh oil to the storehouses. I appointed as treasurer of the storehouses the priests and a bunch of other difficult names because they were considered trustworthy. They were responsible for the distribution to their colleagues. Remember me for this, my God, and don't erase the deeds of faithful love I have done for the house of God and for its services. At that time, I saw people in Judah trading wine presses on the Sabbath, and they were also bringing in stores of grains and loading them on the donkeys along with wine, grapes, and figs. All kinds of goods were being brought to Jerusalem on the Sabbath day. So I warned them against selling the food. The Tyrians living there were importing fish and all kinds of merchandise and selling them off on the Sabbath and the people of Judah and Jerusalem. I rebuked the nobles of Judah and said to them, What is this evil you are doing, profaning the Sabbath day? Didn't your ancestors do the same so that our God brought all the disaster on us of the city? And now you are killing his anger against Israel by profaning the Sabbath? When shadows began to fall on the city gates of Jerusalem, just before the Sabbath, I gave orders that the city gates be closed and not open until after the Sabbath. I posted some of the men at the gate so that no goods could enter during the Sabbath day. Once or twice, the merchants and those who sell kinds of goods camped outside Jerusalem. But I warned them, why are you camping in front of the wall? If you do it again, I'll use force against you. After that, they did not come again on the Sabbath. Then I instructed the Levites to purify themselves and guard the city gates in order to keep the Sabbath day holy. Remember me this as also my God, and look on me with compassion according to the abundance of your faithful love. In those days I also saw Jews who had married women from Ashdod, Ammon, and Moab. Half of the children spoke the language of Ashdod or the language of one of the other peoples, but could not speak Hebrew. I rebuked them, cursed them, beat some of their men, and pulled out their hair. That's awesome. 
I forced him to take an oath before God and said, you must not give your daughters in marriage to their sons or take their daughters as wives for your sons or yourselves. Didn't King Solomon of Israel sit in matters like this? There was not a king like among the many nations. He was loved by his God, and God made him king over Israel. Yet four women drew him into sin. Always the woman. <laughs> Why then should we hear about you doing that? Just making sure you all pay attention, all right? Why then should we hear about doing all these terrible, evil, and acting unfaithful against our God by marrying four foreign women? Even one of the sons of Jehoiada, son of high priest Eliashib, had become a son-in-law of Sambalat the Horonite. So I drove him away from me. Remember them, my God, for defiling the priesthood, as well as the covenant of the priesthood of the Levites. So I purified them from everything forward and, and assigned specific duties to each of the priests and Levites. I also arranged for the donation of wood at the appointed time for the first fruits. Remember me, my God, with favor. Let us pray. Dear yeah. Father, we thank you, we praise you, Lord, for uh, man, the whole book of Nehemiah and what it's taught us, and Lord, uh, what it's going to teach us today. Lord, I pray as I prepare to preach your word, Lord, that you would empty me and myself and fill me up with the Holy Spirit. Lord, that you would just allow the hearts of the hearers to just receive this word and the truth of the word. And Lord, that they would make changes in their lives as you speak to them. Not as I speak to them, but as you speak to them. Uh, Lord, I pray that if someone is here today that doesn't know you as Lord and Savior, they don't even know what I'm talking about. Lord, I believe the Holy Spirit is powerful enough to draw them to yourself today. Lord, may you get all the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. I have entitled today's message, The Impact of Spiritual Laziness. The Impact of Spiritual Laziness. Look, if you and I were writing the book of Nehemiah, we probably would not have included chapter 13 in our writings. It just is not something that flows naturally into what's called successful book writing. If you go back to Nehemiah, you'll see, if you've been following with us, maybe you're, you're newer here. We've been going through the book of Nehemiah, and we see that he was working for the king as a cupbearer, and he heard that his hometown was in disarray, and so he asked the king permission to leave and go and restore his hometown, Jerusalem. So when he got there, he started looking around, he started praying, and, and started building a plan, and he enlisted help to come and restore it, and then, then he had... People are saying it couldn't be done, and he had opposition, and people were threatening him so much that at some point in time in this whole chapters of Nehemiah, we saw that people actually had to work with one hand and hold a weapon in the other hand. I mean, it was dangerous, but yet the Lord persevered them through it all, and God completed what he had called them to do. And so when I was here two weeks ago, we looked at chapter 12 where they held a celebration of all that God had done, that God completed what he said he was going to do. Now, if you and I were writing Nehemiah, don't you think that would be a great place to end the book? Like a celebration about what is going on? But this is God's book, and God is not in the entertainment business. God is for God. God is for our good and His glory. So we have chapter 13 to teach us some viable truths as a church and how important it is to not rest on our laurels but keep growing and desiring God's holiness in everything that we do as a church. And so we have chapter 13 here. It's a stark reminder of how quickly the church can can just kind of fade away from its purpose if it's not keeping focused on what it's called to do. So when we read chapter 13, Nehemiah had gone back to the king. We're not told how long he'd been gone to the king. We're not, we're not told how long it had been. And if anything in God's word, if it was important, God's word would have told us how long he had been gone. But what is important, and what God is showing us here in Nehemiah chapter 13, is what had happened in the time period between when he left and when he was coming back. And that is the church had literally had the wheels fall off of it, and it was quickly falling back into disarray. And it was hard for him to sit there and deal with this and to see and it's a, it's a reminder for us of how quickly it can happen to us. So look, 
This is not the exception to the church. This is not just an example of Nehemiah and Jerusalem of what happened for them. When we look at the New Testament, Paul literally writes in Galatians, I'm surprised at how quickly you're departing for another gospel, not that there is another gospel. It happens to every church. They lose their way. There's warnings in the Old Testament. There's warnings in the New Testament. And as I've shared before from Tim Keller, it says every church, regardless of how theologically sound it is, loses its focus at some point in time or another. When you think about it, when the first 12 were commissioned, don't you think like if you had Jesus pouring into your life, it would be enough to keep you focused and do what God has called you to do? You would think it would be enough for you, right? But yet, here we are watching churches go up and down all the time. And it's just a reminder of how quickly we can fall away spiritually without us even realizing it. Like, here's an example. Think about how many of us have gone through workout programs in our life, right? And you think, like, you're going to sign up and you're going to work out. I, I don't know if you know this, but I used to be a bodybuilder. Oh, yeah. For some reason, okay? I used to be a bodybuilder. When I was at Virginia Tech, I used to go work out every day. And so for some reason, one day I went to work out, and the gym was closed for, for whatever reason. I, don't, I can't remember why, but Hardy's was open. And I went and got a bucket of chicken. And here we are today, all right? And it's just, it's just a stark reminder of how quickly you can go from being buff to this, okay? I'm just saying. So it doesn't take much to get us off the track. Don't make me point out you either, all right? I'm just saying. But when Nehemiah returns, the wheels had fallen off the church spiritually. It had to be so frustrating. It had to be so frustrating for Nehemiah after all the work that he had put in. And verse 8 tells us that he was greatly he displeased. He was greatly displeased of what he had seen. He had put in a lot of sacrifice. He, had, he put in a lot of time, a lot of blood, sweat, and tears just to come back and see people act like they really didn't care spiritually. I don't know about you, but it's taken a lot of blood, sweat, and tears in the six years that we've been here in Hopewell, Virginia. I would hate to think that when our season is over, I would come back to visit and things had fallen off spiritually. I, I would hate to think that all the work that we have put in had, will just go to not. Wouldn't, wouldn't that be sad? And, it, and, and while we are not responsible for what happens in the future, we can't control that. We can't control what happens in the present. If we take our spiritual walk seriously, it can have a positive impact on the generations that follow but if we take our spiritual walk lightly, it will have a negative impact on the generations that follow. So my question to you is, are you taking your spiritual walk seriously? Are you taking it seriously? Because here in our text today, there are four areas of spiritual laziness that we see in this text that, that Nehemiah is going to address. And I want to address here in the church today. That is convictions, giving, priorities, and relationships. In verses 4 through 9, we see um, the conviction. So let's look at it and see how it applies to us today. Eliashib was the priest who was put in charge of storerooms. It's how St Satan kind of got a foothold in the church to start with by putting a relative of Eliashib into his life that needed some help. This guy named Tobiah. Tobiah was a leader in opposition to what Nehemiah was trying to do. Yet, he was a relative of somebody who was put in charge of the storehouses. And so he came to him and goes, you know, I need a place to hang out. I need a place to, to work out of. And, and we're related. How about I use one of the rooms in the church? And now they said, it's not a big deal. We're not using it anyways. And so he allowed him to come. And what happened is he started to get influence within the church. He started to be an integral part of the church. What started out is not that big a deal. This guy who was completely opposed to Nehemiah was starting to have a major influence in the church of Jerusalem. And I've seen this take place in many forms in the church leadership. I had one person who was a prominent church member who allowed their son to teach a Sunday school class. And his son was teaching that there was no thing, such thing as hell. 
and he was teaching within the church, but he was a son. It's okay, right? Then I had this pastor who, who was a faithful pastor for, for years and years. As a matter of fact, he had faithfully pastored for 50 years. Then all of a sudden, he started losing some of his faculties, and he couldn't remember things anymore. And it was sad because he was a godly man. He is a godly man. But then he started forgetting things in the Bible and started teaching things that weren't truth. And what happened is people were like, well, you know, that, we, we know him. We know what his heart is and everything. But what happens to somebody who's just coming into the church for the first time? And is hearing that. And we allow it to fester. We allow, I'm going to have coffee with this. We allow it to fester. And if we, I can give you example after example. I've had people who belong to cults and leadership positions within the church. And we justify it. We justify the actions. We, we allow it to happen into the church. If we're like, it's okay. And it reminds me of a book called um, When God Builds a Church. And it was a story about the Southeastern Church in Louisville. And the pastor, who's no longer the pastor here, uh, pastor there now. But what he did every year, he brought the leadership of the church in. And he asked them, had there been any theological shifts in their lives in the past year? Because he didn't want them leading the different areas of the church if they had changed in what they thought or what they believed. And, you know, we do that here at this church as well. We sit there with our leadership and we want to make sure that what they believe lines up with what we believe. It's not about being legalistic. It's about being biblical, right? Yeah. And so we do the same thing with our leaders of our community groups. We want to, we want to make sure that what we believe lines up with, with what they believe. And if not, there's some changes that need to be made. And we also do that when it comes to church membership. We have a church membership class, and I sit down with each and every single person before they join this church to make sure that they understand what we believe and why we believe it. So it's very important. It's not something that we should ever take lightly. We should stand strong on the convictions of our beliefs. Amen? Amen. So yet, yeah, sometimes we take it for granted. So we see this. Nehemiah called it evil. And it just... <laughs> Think about this. Me and I called it evil. But you know, you don't think it was evil? If you thought it was evil, don't you think you would have dealt with it? But Nehemiah saw through it because he didn't have his emotions involved in it. He didn't have family dynamics involved in it. He saw it was evil and he knew that something needed to be done with it. So Satan has a way of using seemingly small things to infiltrate the church. And we can do it through convictions. And then secondly, we see it happening through giving. As Nehemiah was going, verses 10 through 14, as he was going and he was looking inside of what was happening in the church, and he came back, he started seeing some storerooms that were empty that were usually occupied by the Levites. And he started to see that, that the giving wasn't taking place anymore. People who were joyfully given earlier in earlier chapters, when we see, were now neglecting the house of the Lord. So chapter 10, they were pumped. They were willing to do anything. Then at the, at the end of chapter 10, we see them giving their time joyfully. Yet in chapter 13, we see that they literally had to go back into their different places and, to work because they were no longer being supported by the members of the church. And it goes to remind me of how important it is for us to support the church financially. And I know that's something that people don't like being talked about, but it takes money to operate the church. Did you know that? I, had, I talked to a pastor this past week, and they told me, they said, you know, giving had been going down in our church for a while, and the writing was on the wall that I was going to be let go. So I had to go find another job. And we see this in churches where they, where they, they start to cut the benefits of the pastors, they, they start to cut salaries, and they let positions go because the giving's not there. And yet the sad reality is most people in the church have no clue because they treat the offering basket as a tip jar or the play, depending on who it is. And, and the fact of the matter is, is that, that the church has all the money it needs. It's just in your pockets. For me, I work three full-time jobs. I work three full-time jobs. Have you ever heard me complain about it? I work, my wife knows, I, I work three full-time jobs because the church cannot support uh, me doing this full time. I'm thankful that I'm able to do that. I'm thankful that God God provides. But you know what? I would like to hire other full time people here so we can reach the kids here in Hopewell. 
I, I would love to do that. I would love to hire other full-time people in this church so we can keep pushing back to darkness, but we have to we have to, to, to work with what we got. And we can't do more than that. And some people are like, well, I need help. The church can I had three calls this week, people were just demanding money from the church. <laughs> It was pretty cool. Yeah. Three people called me up. And I, they, they were actually pretty aggressive about it. I want this amount of money from the church. I'm like, have you ever given to the church? No. So where do you think the money's coming from? <laughs> Just part of it. And so we see giving. But then we also see priorities. Verses 15 through 25. Talks about the Sabbath. Upholding the Sabbath was a sign of religious purity. Disobeying the Sabbath was a sign of spiritual laziness. So when Nehemiah came back, he pretty much saw the church being like Walmart on the day after Thanksgiving. Anybody ever been to Walmart the day after Thanksgiving? It's not a fun place. I've watched stories about it online. People were trading wild grasses on the Sabbath, bringing the stores of grain and loading them on donkeys. They were bringing wine, grapes, figs, all kinds of merchandise. The Tyrians were importing fish and all kinds of merchandise. I mean, it was a free-for-all. One, once one person did it, the rest followed. When I was coming up, there was this thing called the Blue Law. Who remembers the Blue Law? There was, you can always tell the old folks in here, right? Um, <laughs> you just you just called yourselves out. People were like, locals over here are like, what's the Blue Law? What's that? I don't know what you're talking about. So they, the Blue Law is like nothing was open on Sundays. Nothing was open on Sundays. And matter of fact, so, so strict was it that alcohol had to be off the table at midnight on Saturdays at the local bars. It was just completely, it was shut down. It was not even heard of. And then, then it started to be a little lax that you could start to have alcohol after uh, 1 o'clock on Sundays. Um, and so if you walked into 7-Eleven, there was chains on the alcohol section before 1 o'clock. And I know this because my dad used to get upset on Sunday mornings. <laughs> Um, it just was. That's how we, I don't know why he was so angry about the chains, but look, they were there. But then all of a sudden, what started happening? It morphed into having sports on Sundays, to travel leagues on Sundays. And it's just a free-for-all in a different way from the Amaya, right? And so this is what we have. It's no different. We're just in a different area. So you can argue about whether or not the Sabbath is something that you should uphold today or not. But the point of the matter is, what are you prioritizing in your life that is squeezing God out? What are you prioritizing in your life that is squeezing God out? I mean, if you're trying to squeeze in church on a Sunday between so many other commitments, what does that say about how you prioritize God the rest of your week? So your work should never be a God in your life. May God be God in your life. And let me see relationships in verses 23 to 29. We talked about dating. We talked about making sure um, that you date godly relationships. I've had that before. I've had that discussion. I've done with that. Until we get to it again in another scripture. But I would say this. Your kids will pay the consequences of you getting into an ungodly marriage. Your kids will have to pay for that. Nehemiah was pointing out one was speaking the language of the believer, and one was speaking the language of the of, of believer. <laughs> Nehemiah was concerned about the effects of the next generation. He knew that one generation's decision would affect the beliefs in the life of the coming generation. So your choices that you make today will impact people's future tomorrow. We may not think about that too much. But he knew this. Your kids' holiness tomorrow will be shaped about how seriously you take your holiness today, church. So these are the four areas that he talked about. Just in the spiritual laziness, when he came back, and this is what he saw. So then he started looking at this thing called spiritual restoration. It's one thing to, to be able to point out all the flaws. And by the way, we all have flaws in here today. We all have imperfections. We all have areas in our life that we're not honoring God. But we have to choose to do something about it, right? Yeah. So Nehemiah's my boy. He didn't worry about pleasing people. Yeah. Nehemiah could care less about pleasing people. If he was concerned about pleasing people, he would come in and he would see that Tobiah had this place and he would go to Eliashib, you know what? It's not really a good look here. You know, this guy's not a believer. He's, he's not into what we're doing in the church. And he really shouldn't have um, a place here in this, in this church. 
That would be what people who are people pleasers try to do. I know you were just trying to make everybody happy, but we can't do it. Nehemiah did the exact opposite. If you read scripture, Nehemiah came in, he saw Tobiah's stuff, and he goes, he saw Tobiah's stuff, and he goes like that. Get that out of here right now. He took everything, and, and I needed that water, so thankfully I have some tea. He took everything and just threw it out, all of his possessions. Susie, I'm going to make sure I didn't throw up. Uh, something hard. But look, I'm sure people were looking at him like he was a little crazy. Like if you were just coming here and start chalking things out, people would look at him a little bit crazy. You think they looked at Jesus a little crazy when he came and turned the tables over? You think people thought he was a little bit nuts? See, people aren't always going to understand when you deal with things that don't honor God. The good news is, you don't have to answer to people. You have to answer to God. Nehemiah shows us some guidance in dealing with spiritual shortcomings. And the first thing is that we need to be decisive. You know, you cannot play around with sin, church. You cannot play around with sin or else you're going to get burned. Nehemiah threw Tobiah's household possessions out as soon as he saw them there. When he saw the tithing issue, he got the Levites, put them in the singers, put them back in their posts. When he saw the profaning of the Sabbath, he closed the gates before the Sabbath. Remember that part where we were reading about what he did to the people who were marrying outside the marriage? When he was pulling their hair? Remember that? Just read that. The point is he didn't let it fester. He dealt with it as soon as he became aware of the issue. The church, when God makes you aware of the shortcomings in your life, do you deal with it then or do you put it on the back burner until it becomes a very forced fire in your life? Let me ask you this question. When you ask your kids to clean their rooms, at least do you expect them to do it when they feel like it or when you tell them to do it? And what happens if they were to look at you and say, I'll get around to it when I feel like it? Slap them old school, right? When God makes you aware of your shortcomings in your life, don't be surprised. Now he brings discipline into your life if you don't deal with it immediately. <clears throat> so secondly, we see this thing called purify. I had COVID last week and my wife bought um, stock in Lysol. Every time I left the room, she was, she was just, like, there was a whole fog one in there. Kind of like the fog we had back here. That was in our room um, whenever I left. And so she bought that. Because here's the deal. <coughs> I don't have COVID anymore, so everybody I hugged before I go. But um, here's the deal with that. When I leave a room, is all the fuck gone? Like, like when I walked out the room, why is she spraying Lysol everywhere, right? Because it's still there, right? Just because you clean out stuff, and just because you clean out stuff in your life, does that mean that everything's okay? You've got to purify it. You've got to make things right. You know what that means in our lives? That means we have to repent and do the things that we should have been doing to start with. Amen. So it's one thing to acknowledge it and be decisive and try to, to make things right. It's another thing to actually do the right thing. So get the spiritual life all out and let it do its thing in your life. <laughs> repent and recommit where necessary. Thirdly, accountability. <clears throat> Nehemiah appointed as treasurer over the storehouses, the priests, um, and a bunch of other names, right? So Nehemiah did this. They were responsible for the di distribution to their colleagues. In the church, I hold people accountable for different areas in the church. I hold them accountable to make sure that they're doing things. When it comes to the different areas of our church and different pastors, I hold them accountable for how they do and how they lead our people in the church. Accountability is a good thing in our lives. And in your life, if you don't have an accountability partner in your life, you are inviting fire into your life. You need to have accountability. You need to have people that shoot straight with you. Now our community groups, when we, when we break up into groups of two or three, this is a time for us to shoot straight with people. It's a time for you to go, look, I'm struggling with this in my life. I need to work on this in my life. That's not a bad thing, okay? I know we sit there and we act like we don't want to tell people our shortcomings and our faults, but it's a good thing to have believers speaking to you in our life. You hear me? I know that some people, when it comes to having accountability software, 
that will literally on the computer people who deal with pornography and other types of sin in their life. They, they get the software and I literally, a lot of them choose me to literally give um, a, a report of what's going on and if they go to some place that they shouldn't be going, I automatically get an email. That's a good thing. You should want accountability in your life. 